What do you think the most unreliable outboard is? Ever? Ever, of all time. I'm going to probably say the Evinrude Vic. Hmm. What makes you say that? Mm, I think because when they first came out, they just kept popping power heads, like in their late 90s. Every, all of them, you just heard nothing but stories mm-hmm. of these engines blowing up on all these bass boats and all these other boats. And I think that kind of gave them the reputation of being notoriously unreliable. That sounds pretty similar to the Optimax and the HPDI's early runs, don't you think? Yeah, actually, that's, I mean, probably, yeah, that, both of those both had a very notoriously unreliable. I mean, they called the Optimax the OptiPop, or the, uh, what did that one guy say? He called it the Poptimax. The Poptimax. Either, <laughs> either one's just as funny. I mean, so, just blow. Same thing for the to. HPDIs. They they got the same reputation. So, so it just sounds like any direct injected early run of a two stroke was just pretty pretty shaky. I mean, if all of them had that kind of reputation at the beginning, but then as you really start to look into it, all that f- fades away after like a couple of years into their production run. Like everybody has nothing but good things to say about them after those particular issues were ironed out yeah that's true i mean the optimax ended up being actually a very reliable engine Mm -hmm. but i kind of i mean i guess it also depends on what your definition of reliability and unreliable really is well yeah because that's that's interesting that you bring that up because i guess the way i would look at reliability is generally You know, can I go out and make it back, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, and last a couple years. Now, yeah, I get that powerhead's blowing. I mean, a couple years? I hope you want more than a couple years out of your engine. (laughs) Wow. Right. But, but I mean, I understand that that powerhead's blowing left and right is, you know, it can be perceived as unreliable. But Mm -hmm. really, by the end of the production run, of that engine was it all that unreliable or was it just that its early reputation was so bad that there was no saving it i mean i feel like that and the fact that four strokes were already kind of getting getting into into place for replacing the two stroke taking over the market yeah people were just like man i don't want nothing to do with this anymore just get rid of those things let the four stroke take over yeah, that, that's probably exactly right. The I don't know, because I didn't really work on that many fix after that. I mean, once they got that reputation, and it didn't take long for people to not even want it. It was almost like the beginning of the demise of an entire company. So yeah. that the, the popping of the powerheads really, yeah, it destroyed it. And I, it, I think it was just also such a complex engine that it just constantly failed. And mm-hmm. then there was very limited mechanics to even work on it. Because right. just like the Optimax and the HPDI, if you don't have a competent mechanic that knows about the engine and how the systems function and how that engine operates, then, you know, anybody could make a really... I mean, they can make a blunder out of that engine if they try and fix it and they have no idea what they're doing Mm -hmm. because the systems are very precise and the way they operate. Like you said, it's a direct injection Mm two-stroke. So like on Optimax, you've got an air compressor, you've got air injectors, you've got fuel injectors. On the HPI, you've got a lot of different filters. you got a high-pressure pump. you got um, close to 2,000 PSI of fuel pressure. So if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know what you're looking at and how the thing operates, you really don't have a place to start to fix it. So then you have a problem with this engine, you take it to somebody, they don't know what they're doing, and then they get in there and just start taking stuff apart, start screwing this, screwing that, messing with this, messing with that, next thing you know, you can't get the engine to run right anymore because they just messed it all up. So that probably added to the reputation of being notoriously unreliable Mm -hmm. so does that make them truly unreliable maybe maybe not i mean i think that's a whole that's a this is a whole conversation about 
like you said, what what's notoriously unreliable and what's reliable and what makes it unreliable. And we should probably even just go engine to engine and, you know, kind of talk about each one. Yeah, I mean, you can bring up, first of all, the E-Tech, which was, I mean, it came right after the FICT, right? That was like the, the FICT was its predecessor. It was the, mm-hmm. the originator of the direct injected two-stroke. Am I correct in that? Yeah, the E-Tech, yeah. Probably, well, um, that E-Tech, it didn't, did it have a lot of problems with blowing power heads or were, were the problems mainly just parts going out and availability or price being an issue um the e-tech is its own thing altogether Mm. because i think what makes the e-tech for most people it i think what it has this notoriously unreliable reputation too mainly because it's so inconsistent like if you have an e-tech um let's say you've got a thousand e-techs mm-hmm. 500 of them are just going to be nothing but problems. And then the other 500 are going to be the most bulletproof perfect engines you've ever had. I mean, I've seen people take an e-tech and have like nothing. They don't do anything to it. I mean, they'll run it for six, seven years, no impellers, no thermostats, no nothing. They put a set of plugs in it and make sure it's got good fuel. That's it. Like I've seen people set, let one sit for three years, come back. I mean, they had, you know, good treated fuel, but they come back, put a battery in the boat, boom, start the thing up, fires up first time. And they just roll out like no issues. And then I've also seen other people that have, you know, the ECUs, the injectors, the, the, um, the thermostat housings, um, some of the water jacket things, like it's just nonstop legitimate issues that those, they have with the engine. Those injectors were always, I mean, that's the first thing I always hear about. Yeah. Is the reason why you stay away from an E-Tech is the injectors. Because well, why is it? They're serialized? To, yeah. To, mm-hmm. what, what exactly does that mean? So it only, it only works on one particular cylinder or for one particular cylinder on one particular engine? Pretty much the way it is, is that if you have an injector, you have to change the injector, right? So mm-hmm. each injector has its own serial number that works with that ECU. And so in order to, like, if you have an injector that you got to change out, you have to have the computer and the software and all the stuff in order to, like, I guess you could say match them. Mm-hmm. So that way that they work together. And I mean, if you're not an Evanrude dealer, which they're far and few between now, obviously, because they you know yeah went out of business right but before that you would have people that would have problems with injectors and they would have to go find a dealer that had the software and the computer to put it on there and then do you know what they do to match everything up to make it work properly which to me is just i mean that's ridiculous yeah that's absolutely ridiculous so like you can't just order a cylinder three injector put it in yourself and no. get it to work no you need to hook up the computer yes. match the serial numbers do all that yes. just to get it to work right yes i mean considering there's not a whole lot of evan rude or e-tech mechanics around anymore that's a huge problem what does an injector even cost i'm pretty uh, they're pretty expensive too they're can not you get, can you get your hands on one like pretty accessibly or is I it i don't know availability might be hard now i mean mm-hmm. i don't know I haven't really tried to order an injector for an ETEP in quite a while. So yeah. whether they're available or not, I don't know. It It's possible, but it's also probably not possible. And they might be super expensive. So, so I guess that means it's the complexity of that entire system mm-hmm. that makes people not want to deal with them. Because you have one person that has a bad you know, issue there, it turns into this whole ordeal where like he gets a bad batch of fuel, messes up an injector. There's no Evanru dealer within a hundred miles of the guy. He's got to tow his boat, you know, a hundred miles to a dealer, get this done. It taught, they charges him a thousand, fifteen hundred, two grand to get his boat running. And it takes a month. So like that whole process will just ruin someone's experience Mm -hmm. to the point where, you know, people that have a good experience with something, they don't really say anything. No one complains when things are good. It's not until they had this horrible experience that calls someone to action to actually be like, you know, go out and publicize, 
how bad of, a, of an experience they had because, I mean, you know, face it, everybody wants some sympathy or some, you know, right. you want to tell people, you're like, dude, this, this is horrible. Like, this is a horrible experience, so I want to tell somebody about it. Yeah, when you start having five-digit price mm-hmm. tag mistakes mm-hmm. constantly constantly breaking on you, it's just I could see how it'll build a pretty bad reputation. But Well, that also probably ties into – why you've got such a bad, you know, a, such a good mixture, because then there's other, there's the other people that have had nothing like they don't do anything to the engine at all. And right. it just works. Right. I was going to say it's a very split camp. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, cause I'm not old enough to have worked on a lot of these engines, mm-hmm. but I've heard, you know, the fair share of stories and, you know, all the, all the nightmares that go along with these engines and, you always hear how unreliable they are, but you know, then if you ever get curious and start looking it up, like what, why, what made it unreliable? You mm-hmm. know, and you start digging into forums and see there is a lot of people who are passionate about those engines that say they're mm-hmm. not unreliable. They're really good engines. And yeah, every engine has lemons or like, you know, it's, I don't know. It's, it's kind of difficult. I think that all three of them, it's like the, it's like the big three that the HPDI 250, 300, the Opti Pops and the Fick, mm-hmm. them old, early, direct injected two strokes mm-hmm. had such bad early runs that it just it failed to save the two stroke. Mm-hmm. It left a, left a sour taste in a majority of people's mouths. And even though there were the occasional good ones, it just wasn't enough to, to keep, them, keep them alive. You know, yeah, I, the OptiMax is kind of a good, you know, comparison there because, you know, the, it was the OptiPop and the OptiPop, the true OptiPop was from like 1997 until I think 2001. Mm-hmm. So after like 2002, they pretty much ironed out all those problems. And a lot of them was problems with oil or overheat, stuff like that, where they it would it would blow up the engine because there it wouldn't get oiling it wouldn't getting oil or it would overheat and and have an issue there Mm -hmm. so once you got like if you have a 2009 optimax that's not an optipop and and someone that's still mad about optipops it's like those engines for the most part are all gone now you know if you have a 97 to 01 Mm -hmm. optimax that's considered an optipop but outside of that, I mean, they made the Optimax all the way up until like the V6, V8 when that came out, like, I don't know, 2016 or something, 17, wow. 18, maybe. Yeah, I know the, the Optimax had a pretty long, yeah. pretty long run. And I, I've never known the Optimax to be an unreliable engine up until mm-hmm. really recently when you start digging into it, people <laughs> really dog on the OptiPop. But yeah. But I guess just after those couple of years, it was actually a really good engine. I've never. Well, that was that's kind of the that's kind of where it gets interesting because you take that Optimax, you know, you got a thousand Optimaxes, and you might have twenty five that are you know, you'll find twenty five people that either had an OptiPop experience or if they didn't, then they bought you know a 2002 to the to the end of the run of the of the engine Mm -hmm. if you if you pool those people together it's going to be like an 80 20 split where 80 percent of the people never had those issues yeah the other 20 percent had that bad issue whereas when it goes back to the e-tech it's a 50 50 split and that's what's amazing about the e-tech is that i've never seen anything that has such a far like it's either all the way to one extreme or the other. Yeah. There's no in between. No in between for that engine. There's either I love it or I hate it. That's no. really weird. Yeah, it's I you know that's you bring up percentages. I I'd, I'd like to see cuz yeah, you can you can bring up throughout the entire production run, you know, X amount of engines would have failed. Mm-hmm. But yeah. What about in those years that they were considered these super unreliable engines? What percentage of them were popping in those years? Like the Fick, mm. which has a, the worst you know reputation yet. Mm-hmm. In those like early years, I, I don't remember what the years were, ninety eight or something. Um, but but those early years of the Fick, what percentage of them were blowing up? Because then afterwards, you know, after they fix these issues, that percentage starts 
mm-hmm. shrinking more and more oh, as absolutely. the years go on. But it had to be a really high number of those fix mm-hmm. um, blowing up in those first couple of years, like most of them to, yeah. to have as bad a reputation as they had. I don't know. I would like to see that, it, that, you know, it would be nice to have numbers on that to actually put, you know, that to bed. I mean, if you take, like, if you look at it t- at a different angle, though, where, like you said, take the engines that were after, after the flagship, you know, mm-hmm. any engine that you put out there in the first, like, that's why they do research and development. They, they R&D engines for five years or so where they just put them through these extreme conditions to try and eliminate those issues because you know if you put out a flagship product any engine doesn't matter car whatever any product that's like brand spanking new Mm -hmm. you're gonna have a few runs of problems that you didn't foresee you know i mean it's a it's a new product so Mm -hmm. you know if you take out the early hpis and the early opti pops and you take out the you know the fixed or whatever and you get into when they've ironed out those problems and actually people got to use the product I think that the issue with a lot of those engines where you got people that have all these problems could probably be more attributed to abuse and neglect or somebody that doesn't know what they're doing with the engine Mm -hmm. and they couldn't get it fixed. So like the reputation of something, let's say you bought an Optimax, you didn't do anything with it for like three years, four years, and, and you started having these problems. And then you take it to a shop and there's only a Yamaha guy there that has no idea about any Optimax, no software, no, no nothing, doesn't know anything about it. And then he just starts, you know, trying to figure it out on your engine. Mm-hmm. It takes him, you know, a month and $4,000 to figure out how to fix your engine. And he partially gets it fixed. But now you've got legitimate problems every time you use the boat, all because of, you know, neglect, abuse, and somebody right. that doesn't really know what they're doing with the engine. Yeah, I think neglect is a very overlooked thing that adds on to this to the bad reputations of engines because there's too many people that you see that just they'll hold out a service for, I mean, way too long, you know what I mean? And, <laughs> yeah. they, and maybe they just don't know any better. But I feel like you really should, you know, if you're buying an outboard, you should know your service intervals because it, it surprises me when they're like, oh, this thing's a piece of junk. It's unreliable. You know, I, just, I haven't changed the oil in five years, but that doesn't matter. It should run. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, are you, what are you talking about? Like, yeah, I, mean, I know we're on two strokes, but, you know, yeah. just any little service thing. Like, yeah, if you if you take care of them, I feel like most of them will, will have lasted more. Mm hmm. But. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see those numbers of, because I think that's a big attributor to, you know, this whole reliable versus unreliable and Mm -hmm. what makes it unreliable. I mean, just like your car, if you take your car and, you know, you drive it for 20,000 miles before you change the oil, your car might take that abuse. But in the long run, you you know, you're going to have all of these legitimate issues and problems that like, continue to occur once you get towards the right. you know it'll shorten it'll years. shorten the life a lot mm-hmm. when you when you you know let the let that oil change run out for so much longer it mm-hmm. might not give you any immediate issues but you know it'll it'll shorten the life of it and start giving you problems that could have been prevented and then you're stuck thinking that you've got an unreliable engine yeah and really you caused it to be you know, or you had a fair share. Or you bought a used plan. one and you didn't, you know, because right. that's kind of the stuff that you can't see. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no way to test for what kind of abuse. I mean, obviously, you can do the visual inspection and see salt corrosion and, and this and that. And, like, you can do a compression check. But you're not going to see, you know, if it what kind of abuse the engine took before you got it. Mm-hmm. So that's I think that's kind of a problem. And there isn't, there's no good way to test for that. You can't see, you know. Yeah. I mean, you can see corrosion and, and salt buildup and a dirty engine. But let's say you don't change the air filter on one of these direct injection engines because most of them have air filters, at least on the Optimaxes. And that thing was starving for air for how many years? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's the unforeseen problems that you could have that 
eventually build up and make something unreliable. All right, and not to mention when you do regular maintenance, you can kind of, you know, spot things that might go bad mm-hmm. before it goes bad. You know, there's, right. there's telltale signs for certain things. And maybe you could have prevented something that would have mm-hmm. led to you having a bad experience and, you know, verbally berating this engine <laughs> <laughs> that really didn't do anything wrong. Well, so what other... I'm trying to think of what else is, because I do want to talk about like what's going to be the most reliable engine. Mm -hmm. But before we even talk about that, I think we should actually cover something else like, you know, um, what about a, what about them carbureted four strokes? Yeah. Those, oh gosh. Again, before my time, I didn't, I haven't turned too many wrenches on them, but definitely unreliable. Uh, Carbureted four strokes are 100% unreliable. I mean, when they're running, they're running great. They're they're awesome, but for the most part, you when did, know. When did carburetors leave four strokes? What was what was about the the year that mm, they stopped? Late two thousands. So probably like. I'm trying to think if uh, anyone made a carbureted four stroke up into the teens, like you know. But even early EFI outboards uh, four strokes had, like, general issues, right? Mm-hmm. Like, well, 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 let's stick on two strokes first. I mean, because we haven't even covered, like, talked about, like, the XR6 or, oh, you yeah, know. Anything with I a mean, switch box. Yeah, anything that's got a switch box today, I would call unreliable. Um, yeah. Just because it's, you know, you're talking about 25, 30-year-old engines. And, mm-hmm. you know, when, I, when we talk about reliable versus unreliable, I think I'm talking about, like, today. If I were to take an engine today, put it on my boat, and go out and, and run around, what kind of problems am I going to see? Or, you know, am I going to get back? If you're on a lake, eh, you can float to the side. You're not going to be in any danger. <laughs> yeah. But, like, if you're going offshore and stuff like that, it's it's a whole different deal. Because, yeah, if you're going offshore, if you're making, like, real long-haul trips, I wouldn't I wouldn't have a two-stroke on my boat. Uh, I mean, not, I, w- not, I don't not think nowadays. I would go that far. I would Not nowadays. What, what about people that's got these E-Techs that are, they got the good batch of E-Techs? I mean, those are two strokes. Okay, well, <laughs> I mean, I guess, but what happens when you do have, like, some kind of routine issue and well, you can't find a dealer? Yes. You can't find a mechanic to work on it. That's kind of its own topic altogether because there's still people that work on them. You can still buy the parts and, you know, mm-hmm. there there's still people out there that know how to work on them. I don't know how that's going to work with the software, though. Like, you know, you got to have the software. So does that stuff have a timeline on it where the software runs out? I'm sure there's third-party companies that mm-hmm. provide that software still. So Yeah, maybe. I'm glad I haven't had to work on any e-techs <laughs> just because of all the, the horror yeah. stories I've heard. I mean, you know, I understand when power heads are blowing. Mm-hmm. It's 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 gonna it's gonna end up with a bad a bad name no matter no matter what you did to fix it because it, it almost seems like like the, the, that stuff still happens you know there's still engines that early in their run um, have these issues but mm-hmm. I guess nowadays you don't really see engines that that pop anymore like no like you know I could briefly we'll, we'll talk about it later more in depth but like a good example is the Merc- the Mercury V engines. Like the Merc V8, mm-hmm. no, it wasn't blowing power heads. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've seen very many blowing power heads at all out of those V8s. Mm-mm. And it's a strong motor, but early on in its production run, it did have like you yeah. know those there, little. There was a litany. There was a list of of problems with that engine. Yeah, and it's I mean, now I, it's all you know getting ironed out. But I guess I guess we really there's not that many other two strokes to cover as far as unreliability, because, I mean, you know, if you got an old Suzuki, if you got something from the 70s, 80s, you know, those are the exceptions. You've, that's an exception to the rule. Like, you're not considering a 45-year-old engine to be reliable, because if you were to take that engine out to the ocean and run it every day for, you know, three months, is it really going to hold up to that or is it only going to hold up to every other, I mean, unless you're rebuilding it and taking care of it 
there might be one out of how many are left. So I would kind of consider that stuff to be an exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know if there's that many other to talk about. The, the Tower of Power, you've never even seen any of that <laughs> stuff. And no, no, I don't know anything about the Tower of Power. Yeah, you you don't want to. Nope. Um, there was some of those Suzuki two strokes were actually pretty reliable. Um, Wasn't there a Suzuki? It's like a V6 with with two spark plugs, a cylinder. Mm-hmm. That just sounds like it's not. Yeah, not, um, not fun. No, no. You know, I think another thing that kills engines' reputations too might be in part mechanics, like mechanics that either a don't want to work on that engine for whatever reason, like yeah, like because of the way it's designed, or like I feel like you know some of those mechanics will start start bad mouthing that <laughs> engine and probably probably dragging it through the dirt when really it's like was it bad or did you just not want to work on it yeah I, we're all of we're all an example of that because well we can start talking about unreliable four strokes too now since we can move into that but like you know i think every mechanic has his own engine that he doesn't like a lot of mercury guys don't want to work on yamahas a lot of yamaha <laughs> guys don't want to work on mercury's like you've got yeah. those like clashes between brands and stuff like that like you know for me you know, I, I'm, I mainly do Yamaha and Mercury. I, I don't mind working on either one. Mm -hmm. Earlier in my career, I was more of a Mercury guy because I got spoiled with the L6. And the Mercury L6, the Verado, I mean, that thing, you take off the cowling and everything is right there. It is the easiest engine to work on out of all the outboards, you know, the modern four-stroke outboards. Yeah. I mean, you take the cowling off, you can pretty much do almost anything in the water. You can change bell cranks. You can change alternators, state, you know, anything on the engine, like shift actuators, throttle bodies, um, yeah, whatever. You can pretty much do almost any of it in the water. I think you which can is, do just about everything in the water. Yeah, the whole thing You can change up. an FSM in the water. It's change the FSM. It's on, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, so it's super easy to work on. But whenever you go to, like, um, the... F200, 225, 250 Yamaha, it's a V engine. Mm -hmm. So everything is covered up by the airbox and all these shrouds and all this other stuff. So you have to take off all this stuff and you can't get into the belly pan in certain spots. There's like all these, you know, complications that make it harder to work on. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I didn't really like working on those because it was a hassle, you know, I'm spoiled. I don't want to have to, you know, yeah. scrunch my hand and do all that. Like when I'm I, when I'm used to boat. doing this, like I'm in the same boat. I've always just thought Yamaha's were too bulky. I don't know. Like, yeah, they're reliable, but <laughs> <laughs> and they might even be the most reliable generally <laughs> engines. Um, but I don't know. I'm just not a Yamaha guy. Yeah. Maybe it's cause I'm so young into my career and like mm -hmm. you, I was spoiled by the, by the L six, but I mean, the Mercury V8 is now the same way. It's flip-flop. Like the V8, if you want to work on anything on that, you got to take the shrouds off, take the, um, you know, split the pans, which is a whole problem all itself, and then take yeah, the airboxes like off V8. and all that stuff. I don't know why. I just like that V8. Even though it might be all that work, I have fun working on that engine. I don't know what it is. I just, I'm a Mercury guy. Yeah. Going through. I love that L6, though. Well, but um, didn't the L6 have problems though, like early on? Oh, yeah, yeah, it had tons of problems. What were, were some um, of those issues? It had all kinds of like map sensor boot problems, it had a yeah, problem with um, putting holes in the bellows for the supercharger, like these, um, they're little hoses that go between the supercharger and the charge air cooler. They had oil cooler problems, they had power head problems where. Like the first designs, they had these like oil squirters that squirt oil behind the pistons. So it mechanically like restricted the engine. That's why they're on like the, I think it's the gen, you know, they call them gen fives or different generations of the actual power head itself. And so from like 04 to 07, those, those weren't that great. That's why they went through, you know, they went to the, they had a 200 L L6 and then they had all the way up to the 275. They had an F, a 350 SCI. They had, that thing only had like a two year run and they killed that. And then like 2008, they got rid of the 275, came out with the 300. So there was a bunch of, 
generational changes, but they had problems with um, different lower unit issues. And I'm just trying to think of what else there's problems with. The, the isolators always falling off. They had the shift crank mm-hmm. problems where they had, um, you know, the, the mechanism between the shift shaft that shifts the lower unit and the shift actuator. Those things were messing up. Um, man, there's just like any engine. I'm trying to think of what else there is. They had FSM problems. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was a whole list of problems that they had, but they ironed a lot of that stuff out. And so if you bought a Verado from like 2008 until they just stopped making them this year, I mean, that's that, that's a bulletproof, reliable engine. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's stories of like the Coast Guard and stuff getting 16,000 hours out of that engine. Really? Yeah. I mean, yeah. No, I know they're really... They're really good and, and sought after even, um, especially now that they're being discontinued. I know I know somebody who sold, um, I think it was, he sold two of them with 3,000 hours a piece on them for 10 grand a motor. <laughs> like, <laughs> like they're, really, they're still pretty sought after, you know. It's, it's kind of crazy, the reputation mm-hmm. they built as far as reliability. Yeah, that's pretty you know, amazing. Later on. That's, see, that's where the stories can go different ways. Mm-hmm. Like, like you've got, you've got your early issues and, and depending on how quickly and how smoothly you iron them out, you could have, you know, much, a much better overall run and not, not have that, not get stuck with that kind of reputation that, mm-hmm. that those early direct inject two strokes were, were stuck with. I would say for the four stroke, the most unreliable engine is definitely the carbureted four strokes. Like just anyone, Mercury, Yamaha. Yeah, done. Yeah, I mean, there for a long time, or well, not a long time, but you had the Mercury and Yamaha had a deal with each other. And like you had, I mean, they call them the Mercaha, Yamaha Merc, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, those had all kinds of problems. Like the a car rated four stroke is just a bad idea because if you put the engines, if you, when you put them away, like there's all kinds of sinking that you have to do between the carburetors in order to get all four of the cylinders or however, you know, whatever it is to, to on, on the most ones that I'm talking about are the four cylinders. Um, you had four individual carburetors and they all had to be synced together. Like they had to be pulling the same amount of vacuum and you had to hook them up to a vacuum mate and sync them together. So if someone put the boat away for a season, when they pulled it back out, you had all these problems with the carburetors. And it was a pain because you had to pull all four of them off. They had these electronic enrichners on them, and those things are stupid expensive. So if you had one of those go bad, you're out five hundred bucks. And then you had to yeah, they're stupid expensive. And so they had you know TPS sensors on them that would go bad um, on the Merker like the Merkaha ones. Those were inverted, so like the way the TPS read was backwards the way the Mercury computer read it and the Yamaha computer yep. read it. Yeah, I remember that. They would just have wear, and then they would just get, as soon as they came out of sync, the engine just would, it, they would have trouble idling, you'd lose wide open throttle, they'd just be all kinds of problems because you'd have one individual cylinder mm-hmm. that was either running lean, rich, whatever the case may be, and it would just take so much work to get the thing to run right. And then... How often would you have to sync and link them? Some people got lucky, but most people had to do it, you know, every other year. I mean, it just depends on, it goes back to the neglect and abuse mm-hmm. um, and, you know, poor fuel quality. As far as four strokes go, were there ever any that had like, like popping issues, like that were just blowing power heads left and right? Mm. Maybe the early L6? Yeah. I mean, the early L6. The exhaust was a little bit lower, so um, there were people that would like have it jump time. Well, that's a whole other issue, is that the engine would jump time. So mm-hmm. it would, if you lost oil pressure at all, it's a tensioner that had oil that kept the chain tension for the timing of the engine. And if that you lost oil pressure or anything like that, or had you know a problem those engines like those first generations they were known for jumping time coming off waves unloading the engine and loading it back up like it would they could jump time 
So that was a whole problem all in of its own. But blowing power heads, I mean, a lot of those were abusive blows or it would ingest water. Um, yeah, I assume they have to be, I mean, definitely abuse related because, you know, I can't speak to the early L6s, but if there's a motor that can take abuse, it's that L6. I mean, they t- I, I say it too much, but they take abuse like nothing I've ever seen, dude. I think you're you're all about reliability right now, like talking about reliability. Well, I think we should just keep yeah. covering the unreliable stuff first. You're right. And then, so like, okay, early, another thing, or like Yamahas, because, I mean, we talk about a lot about Yamaha and reliability, just like the L6, but like the 02 to 04 um, V6s, the 3.3 three liters, those engines, the exhaust manifolds would rot out. That was a big problem for a long time. Hmm. Yeah, I don't. I didn't like those early three threes either. With the ITBs, they were just mm-hmm. they were just dogs. I mean, they were just heavy. Those loud. were another thing. The those you'd have to have to sink and link the individual mm-hmm. throttle vial, valves or the individual throttle bodies. They yeah. yep. You'd have to get out that vacuum to sink those. So those could those could be a pain, but. I don't think you had as many problems with those. The biggest issue with those were the exhaust manifolds rotting out. Mm-hmm. Outside of that, they didn't have much. They weren't that powerful. I mean, they were, you know, they, everybody called them the old girls or the old dogs because they're, you know, this big, heavy engine that you didn't really get the same amount of power. Like, you know, especially when the L6 hit the market, you're talking about this supercharged engine that's got all this power. Mm-hmm. So... Um, the F three fifty, the Yamaha F three fifty. That's right. That one had a lot of flywheel problems, right? Mm-hmm. I what mean, was, what was the problem with those? Why did they go through flywheels like that? Was it? It was only the early ones too, right? No, all of them. All of them. All had of them. A, oh, you know what? Now that you mention it, they have like a like a flywheel timing counter on the software, don't they? Yep. I think like, it's code eighty. I think. Um. Yeah. No. No one would probably say it, but in my opinion, the so the the flywheel has a balancer on it. It's like this big rubber thing, mm-hmm. and the problem is that it you know I would say that the engine is harmonically unbalanced because if you run an engine between I think it's like thirty eight to forty two hundred RPMs for over eighty hours, it harmonically is unbalanced, and that harmonic balancer on top of the flywheel will split. And it will actually shred that thing and like throw the it'll 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 shred that bouncer off and then throw the bouncer off. It'll rip it off and just blast it out like tear it up. Jeez. So it, it I mean it's a con, it's what a, kind of damage would that cause? Depends on how bad, how fast. I mean, if you're running fifty eight hundred RPM and that thing comes flying off of there, it's a bouncer, so it's heavy. Right. Um, it's just going to blow right through the cowling. You're afraid <laughs> it <laughs> sent to the stratosphere type of deal or I don't know if I've, I don't, I've never heard any <laughs> of them coming out of the cowling, but you what know, what was the service it? interval on those 80 flywheels? hours, 80, 80 hours. You had to replace them every 80 hours. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was crap. code 72. I'm not sure. I can't remember. I think it was code 80, but it could be code I mean, 72. Still, like a flywheel can't be cheap either. Mm hmm. So they you have to replace them. a flywheel. Oh, did they, they warranty yeah. every single one of them yeah, for the rest the, of that engine's well, life? In the early years, you had to replace the engine computer and the flywheel. So the early years didn't have the counter in there. So you had to change the ECU that then allowed it to have that counter that would notify the operator of when they were ran that long in that RPM range, which is cruising speed i mean everybody cruises around four thousand rpm okay, so it's only so it's every 80 hours in a certain rpm range mm-hmm. all right all right that makes a little more sense then because i was like man if you're having to replace that thing every 80 hours that's before your 100 hours every mm-hmm. time no. That's- no i mean if you ran the engine wide open throttle all the time never have a problem that's mm-hmm. why i say it's a it sounds like a you know a balancing issue like whatever it is yeah. In that RPM range that would make a vibration or whatever that would mm-hmm. throw that, or maybe it was the flywheel that was a problem. But I kind of feel like if it was really the a flywheel problem, it would happen at all. 
Well, not, not only that, but you would be able to manufacture a different flywheel that didn't do that. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Who'd have thought of that? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. But that engine, would you say that that's an unreliable engine? Because not really. I mean, I think. I don't know, man. I only know one unreliable Yamaha, and it's the HPDI 250 to 300. Like, or was it? 250 to 300 or just that that hpdi it's it's, mm -hmm. it's the only yamaha i've ever heard bad things about yeah like i said i don't personally like working on yamahas too much i'll work on them and i like me a yamaha you know i'm not gonna but <laughs> <laughs> if i'm pegging mercury over yamaha it's mercury i've never mm -hmm. heard anything bad about about yamaha's reliable reliability wise every person you talk to what's the most reliable outboard there is yamaha 100 <laughs> percent now a lot of people are starting to say Suzuki, but I think the price tag is affecting that <laughs> that decision. Yeah, a I, little bit. I think I think they're they're factoring in reliability for the price. And they're right. Like, they're like, bro, go with the Suzuki. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like a hundred percent. Yeah. But as far as you mean, I could save fifteen thousand dollars. <laughs> like yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> but the Yamahas, nothing ever bad about those. Um, what other four stroke would you say is unreliable? I mean, do you know of any? Mm, unreliable any four ones? strokes. Really those those carburetor four strokes. That's about it. The only notoriously. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think of what else had a notoriously bad rap outside of those, you know, the flywheel issue in the F three fifty and um I feel like those carbureted four strokes was was a bad a bad place to be too for an outboard because mm -hmm. you know for for that case and for that kind of unreliability and the performance and all that stuff like you should have just gone with a two-stroke you know mm -hmm. back in that time because especially when you talk about weight exactly i know those old those old four-stroke carbureted motors are definitely some heavy dogs compared to those um the two-stroke ones and you know they're they're not reliable and they don't make that much power, mm -hmm. you know, because they're limited with the technology they have and all that. It's just like, you know, there was no really winning with those. Mm -hmm. I'd say stay far away from those engines, <laughs> just in general. <laughs> as far as modern day engines are concerned, there's mm -hmm. not really any unreliable engines. You know what I mean? There's, yeah. no, there's no unreliable modern day engines. But if I were to have to pick one, you know, going against my beloved Mercury, it'd be, it'd be the, the Mercury V engines, the early ones, especially because they had all those issues with the, with the harness, with the wiring mm -hmm. harness corroding through and, and uh, vibrating through and cutting a wire. Yep. And they also had that issue with the, uh, with the starter mm -hmm. where it, um, take water into it and mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't work. Yeah. And I mean, those issues, they, they got ironed out pretty quickly. Yeah. And, Pretty quietly too, like um, like now the new harnesses have this sheathing over them in that one particular spot where they would, mm -hmm. you know, where they would present the issue, and that that took care of that. You can add a little diverter that sticks onto the cowling and that pushes the water away from the starter, so that takes care of that. And yeah. after that, those V8s are generally. You know, pretty pretty reliable yeah. motors. I mean, I mean that kind of it's the same platform as the 450R that's got the supercharger, but those had, you know, the issues. They've had you know lower unit issues and and very similar issues. But mm -hmm. I don't know if that really makes them unreliable or if that is more just a problem. Because yeah, I mean, just in that train of thought, just to throw it into this this discussion. Um, if you're talking about problems like that, you could talk about, you know, back to Suzuki and Honda. We haven't really said anything about them being unreliable. So those problems, I wouldn't really say that that makes the engine unreliable just as much as, you know, a Suzuki and a Honda with all their dissimilar metals and the problems with their engines mm -hmm. that, you know, make them, I wouldn't say that they last as long. Yeah, <laughs> depending no. depending on where you're at, because nope. I mean, if you take a Honda or a Suzuki after say ten years in warm salt water, like like what we're in, 
I mean, every nut, every bolt, I mean, they're corroding, they're rusting, they're falling apart. Like it's, you yeah. can't work on them because you can't get the bolts up because they're all stripped out and you got to drill everything out and they make it, it's mm-hmm. a, it's a, it's a nightmare. Yeah. Does that make them unreliable though? I don't think so. I no, mean, no, they run like a top, but they <laughs> right. just, they fall apart. You know, everything around the right. engine falls apart. Right. It's just like, so it's not, it's not ideal. I guess that's a good way to move into what would you say is the most reliable outboard? Well, look, I guess, I guess I will. Your opinion. No, but, but even in my opinion, no matter how much I, I I don't want to, it's, it's the Yamaha F-150. Yeah. If if I had to think about one, one outboard that not only have I never had to, to fix anything on them, which, you know, I don't have 10 years experience. So, so that's not really saying a whole lot, Mm -hmm. but I've never even heard of anybody having to fix one. (laughs) I have never heard a story of somebody having to fix something broken on a, on a Yamaha F-150. Not to mention that that thing's been around for how long? 20 some years. And yeah, if I don't know if it's made it that long, but, but around 20 years at least. And they haven't changed anything except the cowling. Yeah, there's right? not not really. I mean, the two point seven liter is there's really not that much. There's there's really not much has changed in that engine. I mean, that engine's been pretty much the same since it came out. I mean, it's it, like the definition of if it ain't broke, don't fit, don't fit mm-hmm. with it. Like, don't mess with it. Just yeah, like, I'll definitely agree with you. I would say that I know you'll agree with me. You love <laughs> that thing. Oh, please, by all means. I would, take the reins in this one because I would you've definitely got experience say that when it comes to probably the most reliable outboard, I would say it's yeah definitely the Yamaha F one fifty. Well, I think. the most re- did you ask me the most reliable outboard or four stroke? Yeah, four stroke or outboard. I mean, what would you say the most? Because I don't know. Maybe if we're gonna like, if we're gonna say the most reliable outboard, I know it's a totally different application, and mm-hmm. but the ninety. I mean, the Yamaha two stroke ninety. That's another thing. <laughs> Yeah. Not only do you never hear of it breaking, you see videos all the time of like rednecks freaking just running them things through the through the shallow water, mm-hmm. smashing them through th- tree stumps and redlining them out of the water, just banging off the limiter, and they don't stop. They don't no. stop running. I mean, I've seen what was it? Was it? I want to say it was a ninety or around that. Just that old Yamaha two-stroke platform. They they took it and like. Buried it in the sand. Oh yeah, that boat guy did that. <laughs> was it that boat? Guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it just, and just and just ran it. Just, just ran kept it. running. I think it was a forty, maybe. I don't know what was. I'm, maybe that was like a twenty twenty five or something like that. But oh yeah, he just yeah. I mean, put sand in the intake. I mean, buried the lower unit and ran it, and then like it just doesn't. And then I mean. <laughs> did it blow up? Did it quit? No, it video? did not blow up. He cleaned the car, right, cleaned the <laughs> thing out, and then drove off in that thing. Like, had it's to put an stupid. impeller in it, but that was it. Like, it's it just stupid. That makes no sense. It's just like, <laughs> like you have to. It's one of those engines you have to try to kill. Yeah, and and even then, you can't kill it. <laughs> he, he started it, ran it on the ground, and then threw the thing into the water, and then it just boop 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 running running into the water, and then just shut off, pulled it out. Wipe the thing off, put fuel to it, and it starts right back up. No problems. Ridiculous. Like, yeah, I would. Ridiculous. I don't know. Between the F one hundred and fifty and that ninety, well, the there's also the one hundred and fifteen, one hundred and thirty, the V four. That was another Yamaha engine that was just like stupid. Like mm-hmm. they don't break. Yeah, like they do not break. The only like the bet if you wanted to break the engine, you just don't put oil in it. And even if you didn't put oil in it, I mean, how long was the thing going to run? It's it could still, probably run it for still like, run yeah. a while before it broke. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you got there's a lot of people too. I know that overall, Evan Rude and Johnson have a bad a bad rap, mm-hmm. you know, in general. But but there's a lot of people that stand by. I think it's like anywhere from seventy to eighty, like those seventies, mm-hmm. uh, two stroke Evan Rudes and Johnsons. They just it's the same. It's the same kind of deal. They just don't stop running. Mm-hmm. I, I guess. I guess there is some truth to that saying. They don't make them how they used to. No, they don't. And there's just there's nothing you could take nowadays that's made nowadays and do that kind of stuff to those engines. No. Even the even the F one fifty. No, you're not. You you're couldn't not, do that to a four stroke. You're not abusing an F one fifty like no. Like you're abusing 
The two stroke. Any any old two stroke from no. back in the Dizzy, like back before back when my parents were born. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're definitely not doing that to a four stroke. But the same thing, let's let's talk about the Evinrude. You know, fifty fifty, same thing. If you move before the Fict and all that, they had the the Ocean Pro and the Ocean Runner, the Johnson and Emerald. Mm -hmm. And that engine, same thing, dude. That thing ran forever. Yeah, there was somebody who, who still had one um, at the marina for the longest time and mm -hmm. would, would ride out that little Grady White mm -hmm. with, the, with the, what was it, a Johnson? Yeah, he had a 175 Johnson Ocean Runner. Yeah, yeah. And that thing, I mean, every time. Every uh, time. It, it never, you got to know how to start them, though. Right. That's right. the only thing. You got to know how to start the engine. But it never had to get fixed. No. It's just it. I don't even think that dude serviced that motor in <laughs> no impeller years. for twenty years. <laughs> I mean, I can't even talk about it in the current tense anymore or the present tense because it's um he repowered it with a Suzuki, mm -hmm. um like right before we left. Yeah, but I uh, had you just <laughs> crank them things up, mm -hmm. prime it up, and. Yep. Rip it, make yep. a big old smoke cloud, but it's gonna run. Yeah, as long as you squeeze the prime ball, prime it up, put it at three quarters throttle in neutral, turn that thing on, dude. It will just rev up, blow smoke everywhere. But yeah. pull but that thing back, but and that's, it is the, running. that's the beauty. That's the beauty of those two strokes. Mm -hmm. I kind of like that, even though I didn't grow up in that time, and and you know, I didn't I didn't have a whole lot of experience with two strokes. It was still kind of fun to mm -hmm. to be out there at the dock and. Just <laughs> <laughs> trying to keep this thing alive <laughs> for the first 15 seconds and then you know after you after you clear it out a little bit you can't see anything around you for a while but yeah yeah you're like man look at that thing go and it just runs like, like it, yeah like it's i had one on a um i had a 250 ocean pro on a 21 mako for like three years same thing the key i mean for me what i did is I ran it three times a week and kept non-ethanol fuel to it. As long as I did that with, I mean, I over-oiled it and I just changed the spark plugs more often. I know mm -hmm. people want to get that perfect, you know, like not too lean, not too rich, where it's getting that perfect plug burn. But to me, keeping those engines running, I over-oiled it and then just changed the plugs sooner. Just because, I mean, it... Dude, it just ran like it did matter. It, mm -hmm. it did not matter what I did. I mean, I could abuse it. Same thing and change the gear lube. I don't think I ever changed the impeller in that. I was lazy back then, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I ran it three times a week and that thing ran forever. See, but I don't know for me personally, even though I, I, I see it and I know it and I know those things are great. I can't go that far offshore with one of those engines, bro. I wouldn't trust it. I wouldn't trust it. I'd be like, yeah. Uh, what if today's the day? What yeah. if it's not going to make it past today? Well, I think now too, it's getting to the point where those the stuff's so old. You know, you're talking about thirty year old engines almost, and I mean, not not all of them are that old, but um, the components are starting to wear out, especially in the heat. Like mm -hmm. the timer bases, they've got plastic carburetors on some of them so the bulls will warp and then it'll leak fuel so you gotta change all the cars so like they're starting i mean you don't see that many of them left anymore mainly because of that because they're to the point where the material that they're made out of and the parts on the engine that are made out of it's starting to deteriorate and it just there's not it's not that mechanically the engine is unreliable or something like that it's just that it's 30 old 30 year old plastic there's nothing that you can do to stop it from you know over yeah. it's overuse it's just it's like everything that you have everything's going to wear with use and it's just starting to wear out OX66 oh i mean a, that's a reliable one another staple point of reliability <laughs> you know but um as far as it's it's weird so some of those reliable two strokes that like you hear are notoriously reliable mm -hmm. i've only ever seen bad things with like the ox 66 is I've, i haven't seen too many of them but the one on the carrera those things were given problems left and right like there was always an issue with those you know which one i'm talking about the oh yeah yeah the 250s on that that well 
Uh, again, um, you know, I guess everybody ends up with you know, like, like I said earlier, there's always there's always a lemon in the yeah in the production line, but there's always going to be one. But I mean, I've I've had, I mean, that Venture had OX sixty sixes on it, and those Venture? things, yeah, that before it, the L sixes, yep. Before that, it had it. After the OX sixty sixes, we ended up getting some um, three three two fifties that got put on them. But they had like almost four thousand hours, and they came from a rental boat company. So oh, you know God. they were used. Those and are used four thousand like, <laughs> hours. Yeah, that you don't. You don't even. No, just no. don't even talk about those hours. Yep. Man, those those hours have seen some. Yeah, some abuse. We had so many problems with that practice. <laughs> But, I mean, I had an OX-66. I mean, granted, the Ocean Pro, the OX-66, a lot of these two strokes, I mean, they are thirsty. You just have to just, I mean, you're getting one mile to four gallons of gas. Like, it's like just stupid. I mean, not that bad, but it's just stupid the amount. Like, they just drink fuel and oil. But, really? It's oh, funny yeah. because, you, because you know two strokes for their efficiency, right? Isn't that? Direct injection. Only direct injection two yeah. strokes. Yeah. Oh, any of these okay. other carburetors and stuff like that? I, mean, I see. So that's why. So so the direct injection two strokes were a a direct hail mary to try to save the two stroke. Yeah, it was a direct because that was to the try problem to, to try to make it competitive with four stroke efficiency. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, they all kind of there was kind of like a I don't know. It, it's weird because you kind of had the two strokes and they were it was it was the fuel efficiency that was really the problem they wasn't really a reliability issue with them because like we said the ocean pro the ocean runner even the um you know the ox 66 the the 90 the 130 the um all these in, all these two strokes they were they were super reliable but man did they drink fuel and so late 90s early 2000s the direct injection all kind of hit the market and like you, they're all these problems all these problems but once they got the problems ironed out super fuel efficient but by the time all those problems got ironed out you know you were coming into the early 2000s with the f-150 the 33 liter the um the Merc efi like they were all these four strokes hitting the market that just took over i mean yeah once once the four strokes became reliable you kind of had a period of time also between, um, you know, today and back then where like bass boats and stuff like this, these guys, the weight was a problem. I mean, the F-150 still weighs like 520 pounds or something like that. I mean, it's a heavy engine. Yeah. Where the 300 V8 Mercury weighs like 512 pounds. So you got like a 150 four-cylinder and a V8 300, and they're the same weight. So... A lot of these bass guys wouldn't take a four stroke on their boat because of mm -hmm. the weight. You know, if you want a 300 horsepower, the thing was almost 700 pounds. Whereas that, you know, two stroke was 500 pounds. Yeah, you still see two strokes pretty prevalently in, in boats like just made for, for nothing but speed. Mm -hmm. Like like small boats made for nothing but speed. Like bass boats and um, I don't know exactly what they'd be called, but but there's like a, a like a, a small group of people in the Keys that that have these like like little mini looking speed boats, mm, and they just yeah. throw they throw a 250 or 300 mm -hmm. two stroke on the back of this thing, and oh well they didn't even make 300s back like a straight two stroke, but like they'll mm -hmm. throw a 250 on the back of that thing and just mm -hmm. send I mean, it. Send it. You'll hear them things screaming, but those boats they go 90 mile an hour, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous. I yep. personally. Don't ever want to go 90 miles an hour in a boat any smaller than like a legitimate speed boat. Dude, yeah. It's just, yeah. That's I don't a whole have different the, thing. I don't have the risk tolerance for that. I don't, I'm not an <laughs> adrenaline junkie like that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I feel you. I mean, it's that, that's kind of an interesting concept though. I didn't ever even really thought about that as like the direct injection being a direct, you know, resolution to the fuel problem. And then, you know, it ultimately being its biggest downfall. Yeah. They tried to save the two stroke by, you know, making it compete with a four strokes efficiency mm -hmm. and being like, oh, well, it's just as fuel efficient. It's lighter and has the same power. Mm -hmm. You know, now, how back could then you, they didn't. Right. And like, but how could you go wrong? Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, buddy, you could go really wrong. <laughs> 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 they showed that in the first couple of years. Oh, yeah. And then it just killed it. And then you started seeing reliable. Four strokes, and it was like they started bridging that, bridging that gap. 
Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of what else was um, super reliable. I mean, the reliability of those those two strokes, like the 90s, 115s, 130s, is astronomical. And then, but I mean, at the same time, if you look at today, I've seen Suzuki 140, um, which is its own. I mean, that's a that's a whole different thing because the 150, 140 for Suzuki is two different animals, really. It's a whole like hundred and hundred fifteen pound difference. For yeah, ten horsepower. Yep. I think yep. the Suzuki one forty is pretty cool, reliable or not. Which I'm pretty. Which sure it is reliable, really reliable. Yeah, it's, it's super reliable. As long as you change the anodes in it. Yeah. I mean, if we're being honest, anything Japanese, <laughs> is, you don't have to question reliability. <laughs> but if it is a Suzuki or a Honda, change the anodes every five minutes. <laughs> just, <laughs> just save yourself in the long run. But, yeah, but yeah, those one forties are really cool engines. Yeah, um, they're they're any of those nowadays. I mean, you put a Merc one fifty and an F one fifty Yamaha. Even though I I cloud on that um, Yamaha F one fifty, that Merc one fifty is just the same thing. I don't think there's anybody that makes once you get below like the two hundred. I don't think there's anybody that makes an unreliable engine. It's just no. It's just because of the horsepower that you're in. The only common issue i saw with the 150 uh four stroke mercuries was um which is also an issue excuse me on the early uh f-150 yamahas but in a different way was the trim level indicators on both those engines funnily enough Mm -hmm. the same thing the trim level indicators were a a, a big problem like they'd always be yeah for the yamaha always be getting stuck but the difference is with the mercury when it would act up Mm -hmm. it would limit your rpm yep and then it would you know like a customer you know a boat owner that doesn't know any better is thinking he's got a running issue like a misfire Mm -hmm. or or like something something related to you know fuel spark something like like that kind of running issue and they'll lead you on a goose chase when really it just thinks it's trimmed out of the water and it's holding you back you know it's stopping Mm -hmm. you from from destroying it but um but other than that yeah that merc 150 was or is just as reliable as as any other engine they make nowadays. It's just like you said, anything under two hundred, you can't go wrong. No, Not I've nowadays. seen I've seen both Merc one fifties and Yamaha yeah, close to. The only difference I'd say between reliability now and back then is nowadays you do have to be on top of the servicing mm-hmm. and maintenance more. So than like the reliable two strokes. Yeah. Like the two strokes would take, strokes. A, they would take abuse. <laughs> like you they can, would. Yeah. You, I mean, but nowadays you still, you have really good reliability depending on how well yeah, the care you, you took of that engine. You can't really abuse them. I don't think the Yamahas will take the same amount of abuse before I get off the F, the F one fifties and the, um, um, Merc one fifties, the Suzuki one forty. I've seen all those engines pushing 10,000 hours. Like I've seen them on trap boats where um, they're eight, 9,000 hours on the engines. And I mean, most of them, they don't really blow up. They just get rid of them because it's that time. I mean, mm-hmm. you put 9,000 hours on an engine, it does start to, I mean, things start to fall apart. It's just what yeah. it is. Yeah. But, but yeah, no, I, I don't think you could go wrong with either one uh, of the three. Now, when it comes to the abuse, I'm with you 100% that I think that Mer- Mercury is going to take way more abuse than a Yamaha, Suzuki, Honda, or any other manufacturer. Just seeing what I've seen with charter captains and stuff like that, I've I've seen... Well, seeing they what will you hold see, up more. Seeing what you see when you compare the fact that most charter captains have Mercury's. Um, well, most of the bigger ones run in big boats. They they, mm-hmm. they have Mercury's and they abuse the crap out of these engines. Mm-hmm. Um, you see that they those engines hold up just as well as you know a regular a regular boat owner using a Yamaha or any other engine. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like the lower units handle so much abuse those oh, yeah. lower units oh my goodness i mean how many times have you pulled the drain plug 
on a mercury lower unit and there is nothing but water in there, not a drop of oil. Mm -hmm. But it didn't blow up. No. Nope. And who knows how long it was running like that. Yeah. Because they definitely surpassed 300 hours, mm -hmm. you know, on the on the service interval. And <laughs> <laughs> since or 100 hours, I guess, for... for yeah, but some of them guys are putting oil. 200 hours or more on them before they change the lower unit oil. Oh, yeah, which is exactly what I'm saying. How many of those hours were nothing but water in there? Yeah, even it's if amazing. It's, even if it's half and half, half oil, half mm -hmm. water. Water is not good in a gear case. Mm -mm. It's going to go boom, boom. I've seen, I've taken a um, gear case on a, on a 150 Merc, and it was actually during Irma. So um, it was a gear case that the shift crank inside the lower unit broke. Mm -hmm. Granted, this was after like 4,000 hours. Mm -hmm. original gear case. So you got a gear case with wow. 4,000 hours on it and the shift mechanism broke. So I said, I had the thing apart. Boom. We got hit with Irma and it was out in the shop right on the thing and all that flooded. So that thing went underwater. It was packed full of sand, rust, everything, full salt water on the inside of the gear case, all the bearings, everything all rusty. Just, you know, it was rough, right. like, like yeah. rough. And I cleaned that thing out, put it all back together. I didn't change any of the bearings, none of that stuff. I mean, I changed the, no, I didn't change any bearings and nothing. Nothing but that shift mechanism. Put that thing back together. You know, I wiped the rust off the, off the stuff as much as I could. Filled it with oil. He took it and ran it for 30 hours, brought it back. I changed the oil out of it again because it had, you know, just, it was wearing all that rust off. Mm -hmm. He put another 2,000 hours on that engine, on that lower. Like, jeez. I mean, and I'm talking like sunk, submerged, open. So like, yeah. So everything got evenly. Dispersed I pulled with that sand and leaves and all kinds of stuff out of the lower unit. It was it was bad. I was like, oh man, this might not be good. But filled out with oil, sent it two thousand hours. They just take it. Yeah, it's it's actually amazing. I mean. I know we were saying nothing takes an abuse quite like them old two strokes, but if anything comes close. Mm hmm. Mercury, some of the Mercury engines can just take it. The L6 takes it. Yeah. Takes it for what it's supposed to do. For what it's supposed to do. I mean, I've seen I've seen guys back down on fish with those L6s in quad engine boats and have all four engines underwater. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, it's 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 insane. And then, you know, I mean, how many times they did that? I don't know, because they would blow power heads, but because of water ingestion. Right. But there's nothing else I've ever seen that you just take the engine, sink it, and then, you know, boom, right out. And then, you know, every, you know, hundred time that you did it, it you'd blow one up. But mm -hmm. and then the shifting too, like just the in general. Oh yeah, there's from, people that I mean, they'll go from forward <laughs> what's neutral. Bang, reverse, mm -hmm. like just skip it, straighten the reverse after yep. they find a little spot, boom, back down hard. Mm -hmm. And it's like, ooh, <laughs> yeah. how is yeah. that thing still going? Yeah, <laughs> from 20 miles an hour to reverse. Yeah. Like, like no, I mean, no. I don't care if you did bring it back to, to the idle detent. Your boat's still going 20 miles. You're still going with the weight yeah. of the boat and the water turning that prop. And if, bam. Yeah, I mean, you hear them. You, oh, yeah. yeah. They're, they're definitely telling you, like, hey, man, this ain't good. We can handle it for a little bit, but it ain't good. <laughs> like, it's, yeah. I, it, it's pretty amazing the, the abuse that they'll take. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess it all depends on what, you, what your definition of reliability or unreliable yeah. really is. Mm -hmm. Because... Yeah, for the average Joe. Oh, yeah. For the average Joe, I'd tell you to go with the Yamaha. Yeah, you know or, the, I mean? or the Mercury or the Suzuki or the Honda. Sure, but, I mean, but as far as, like, you, you want to, like, just forget about it. Like, you, you don't want to know anything about the engine when you got a service above it, and you just want a reliable engine that's going to last you for a long time, just get a Yamaha. You know what I mean? It, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm between the two. I'm between the two. So, for between me. which two, Yamaha and Suzuki or Yamaha and Mercury? I'm I'm definitely between Yamaha and Mercury. Um, for you, for me, right? Because for me, I'm picking a Mercury, but that's because I know how to fix them. You know what I mean? So even if it does break, I don't care how 
reliable well, compared well that, to the Yamaha. The V8, though, dude, the, the, the V8 Mercury, with the weight and the power and, I mean, the reliability of that, I mean... It's hard to it's hard to pick something better than that engine. It is. I don't I don't know. I might pick the Yamaha over it because the four two is easier to work on than the new V eight. And for me, I'm all about me. What's well, easy for me? Right. So, <laughs> yeah. But, but at the same time, um, I, I could work on both of them. But they're just dogs. They're just big, heavy. That's how that's what I've, that's how I've always known a four stroke Yamaha is just big, heavy. Yeah, but you'll like take it, just as many, many hours with the it Mercury. Gets the job done, but it's. it's I mean, it's heavy, look at look at um, <laughs> Jack's putting four thousand hours on it in two years. Oh yeah, I with mean those V8s. You know how long it would take me to put four thousand hours on an engine and and Cam and some of those other guys with those with those mm-hmm. engines they. Just as They're many over hours four thousand hours, mm-hmm. so and over four thousand hard hours, like like every day running, always running, gun, go, mm-hmm. go, 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 go. In all honesty, actually, I would probably take the Suzuki because of the price. <laughs> like legitimately, if if it's me spending money right now sure. because of the price, I mean, it has nothing to do with the reliability because, like we just been talking about, all of them. Are reliable these days mm-hmm. i mean i think now it is to the point where it's either brand you know like what's your brand like ford chevy toyota what's your brand chevy. and that's and that's, <laughs> <laughs> and that's what that's what people are going to go for because if you put them all up in a row i think reliability wise and like they're all good for the for the average person they're all going to make it also, I so, guess a big factor today, I, I think the biggest factor today, I guess, is availability. Yeah, that too. Along with price. That too. You know, when, as far as when you're considering what what you want to buy, um, reliability isn't isn't as big of a deal as it used to be. Because mm-hmm. back, you know, back, back then people were pretty passionate about Yamaha is a lot more reliable than Mercury. Yeah. And like, I got into the industry and I... I didn't see that. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I have I didn't see that side of things. Maybe I got in when Well, when I don't think good. I don't think that had been a thing since like two thousand twelve. Like Right, that's about when I'm when I'm referencing to, like the two thousands, mm-hmm. early two thousand tens. Yeah. Now if you're talking two thousand five, eh, you might there there might be some um there might be some some discussion there. Well, in 2005, what was out for Mercury? Was the L6 out yet? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the L6, but it was not. When did the L6 come out? 04. 04. It's like December 04, okay. so 05. 04. So we're talking 05. Yeah. You're not getting anything Mercury because you had the L6. Yeah, the Optimax. Uh, the Optimax was good, but let's say you want a four-stroke. Yeah, they didn't. I mean, you had the the, the EFIs, which, I mean, from 02 to like 04, we had the Mercahaws Yama Merc, so... You're buying a Yamaha. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, it might have a Mercury sticker on it. It's a Yamaha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's a whole argument there. I don't know. I think there really isn't much that... I don't think the discussion is really there anymore as far as reliability versus unreliability. No, I mean, the, the notoriously unreliable outboards, there's not that many out there running anymore. And those that are are the ones that that are good there's no they are now a testament to the good side of those notoriously bad engines so yeah. if you're running an a, a 2002 e-tech now like it's a 20 year old engine what do you mean it's unreliable i mean it might now be getting unreliable because it's a 20 year old motor yeah. but um the so-called notoriously bad engines you know that's really this really did good as far as uh, straightening out my my thoughts and my opinions on this whole thing. This discussion has been great because because it's it's kind of showed me that you know maybe maybe some of these engines that I might have been scared to work about was scared to work on because mm-hmm. of their reputation is probably actually not not too bad, not too big of a deal to work on it. You know, it's they just they just had two. They were beaten down too hard for for what the situation was. Yeah, you know what I mean, it was new technology, 
and it's not it can't be the first time that that new technology has um has had some catastrophic failures in its in its origin you know mm-hmm. like in its in its beginnings so so i don't know i guess you just find the years find the years to stay away from those early years of those you mm-hmm. know direct injection outboards while they were still being ironed out that new technology and mm-hmm. everything past those years is is good to go yeah i, I kind of want to I mean, when it comes to working on the engine now, though, that's a whole that might be its own different discussion, because now, like, let's say you want to work on an XR6. You're talking about working on a 25 year old engine. No, no, no. Older than that. When was the XR6? That's OK. Either way, any of those old you want to work on a fixed an XR6 or any of these older engines. You're working on a 25, 30 year old engine. Mm-hmm. Now, multiple different things. You've got availability of the products to get them, the price of the products to get them, in order just to fix them. And then, not to mention, I don't think that there's as many mechanics. Well, down here in Florida, up north in the freshwater, it might be a little bit different of a story. But as far as down here, most mechanics and shops won't even work on those older engines because of the the simple fact that you get on the engine right and it's not running right okay you fix it for because it's the switch boxes the switch boxes were bad you change that out it's all running right Mm -hmm. okay cool you go out for the test run you run the engine it runs great but then the guy uses the boat twice in say three months and now the engine doesn't run anymore. Right. And then he wants you to come look at it. Oh, you're the last one to work on it. I've only used it twice. So then you go look at it and the stator has failed mm-hmm. because it's a 20 year old stator. So now you put a stator on there. Okay. It works. You go out and run the boat. He runs it twice. Two months goes by. Now the engine doesn't run. All oh, the rectifier regulators has busted now. Okay, now the ignition coil goes, then the, the, you know, the trigger goes, then this goes, then that goes, then the magnets come off the flywheel, then that, that, and now all of a sudden, you've got an engine that every time he uses it, every couple times, he has another legitimate issue with his engine and the mechanics to blame because he's the last one to work on it. I mean, yeah. you kind of hear the same story a lot of times where, you know, oh, this guy worked on it, and that guy worked on it, and this guy worked on it, and that guy worked on it. Well, then the mechanic that you got going over there now, yeah, you're just like, going to be the next guy because... You're just, you're just the next guy they're, they're going to be dragging through the dirt. Yeah. Because it's because the engine's just not... Because it's gotten so it's old. Too old. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the external, not the mechanical aspect of the engine, the block and that, it's got good compression, all that, that's all fine. It's the actual parts of the ignition system and the fuel system that are it's deteriorating the yep. they're just not going to hold up anymore and especially when you start running the engine wide open throttle and using it you know now if you get on there and you start running it two three times a week your problems might slow down mm-hmm. but using it two three times letting it sit for a month two months as most people use their boats i mean let's face it most people don't get you don't get to just use your boat every weekend like you no. you want to no. most of the time it's you know, you got this to do this weekend, that to do the next weekend. You get to use the boat, and then two weeks go by. Then you get to use it. Then three weeks go by, and so you only get to really use it two, three times over a couple months. And stator goes bad, switchback goes bad, ignition coil goes bad, trigger goes bad, rectifier regulator goes bad, the flywheel messes up. Like it's just the engine harness goes bad, and yeah, and then it gets into the. I mean, we had at the marina that one XR6 that came through, and and I had a really similar uh, series of events as far as what all had to be replaced. And every mm-hmm. time I took the thing out, it was another. Luckily, a lot of them happened on my sea trials. Like, mm-hmm. every time I took the thing out after having fixed something, something else was bad. And it was just <laughs> a giant chain of this huge diagnosis. All for, in the end, it was like, okay, Listen, kid, because it was—I think it was a younger kid with the boat, a sentimental value, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like you know, now with now in parts and labor, you're you know you're you're at 
what the whole boat's worth, <laughs> engine included. You know what I mean? Are you yeah. sure you want to keep going? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, he said no, obviously, because, yeah. you know, you got, a, you got a boat like that. Your pockets aren't infinitely deep. No. I kind of wish that a lot of people would, would just start there. Start with the, with the no. Because it's unfortunate that the intentions are that, you know, you're going to get the boat fixed and be able to run it and use it. Well, but a lot of times, yeah, seven, eight times out of 10, it turns into a whole slew of problems and it gets so expensive that it's like, man, it, ugh. and now you're stuck. You got to pay it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean, like all this stuff was done, mm-hmm. all this labor, but you don't get me wrong. We told them, we told them from the start, like, Hey, this, this is probably not going to be worth it. As a matter of fact, you know, we're going to stop working on two strokes here soon. Mm-hmm. Um, we had stopped working on them before that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it got, I think it got snuck in as like a, like a friend or whatever, you know, somebody's... A lot of times it ends in a rough situation, you know, rough way where it no one's happy, you know. Yeah. And, and, and in the end, you, you're left with a boat that you can't use. Mm-hmm. I mean, Or with rough. a boat that, in this one's case, we got it not, you know, fully fixed, but it was like, you know, good enough for him. He was like, he was mm-hmm. like you know what? That's good enough. The boat couldn't even get on plane before coming in here. At least now mm-hmm. it gets on plane and hits X amount of RPM. But now you've got a fuel issue that yeah, know, I was not, gonna say it's not hitting wide open throttle fully. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think was, he had a, he a boat problem. I think he had a problem with the the, the fuel, fuel tank system or the sender or anything. Yeah. Like, yeah, it was it was probably something like that. But at that point, now labor is going to really start ramping up. Mm-hmm. You got to start sea trialing it a whole bunch with an auxiliary tank and. And this and that, and it's just way not worth it. No, I think that the issue with that whole boat is that, yeah, it's just an older boat, but you're going to have those problems with any 20, 30-year-old boat, and I, it's just kind of what it is. So whether that makes something reliable or unreliable, uh, hopefully this kind of helps. I mean, like you yeah. said, it helped you kind of realize that it, it's not really an unreliable engine. It's just the perception. And, and po- I mean, there are some. So, so I'm not saying that some aren't notoriously unreliable because, right. like we said, I mean, that. But, but if, you th- if you think about it, technically, all the ones that we're going to pop, if they haven't popped at this point, then, mm-hmm. I don't know, some, no one's really buying it. But, yeah. but I think all the ones that we're going to pop, popped yeah. in, those, in those first couple of years. Yep. You know, if you're going to if you're going to run an outboard like that, especially an older one, Mm -hmm. I think it's something that you should be able to work on. Like like someone that wants to run a 30 year old engine, that should be something that you could work on. Yeah, because when you have to start paying someone to work on stuff like that, for one, there's very there's very few people anymore that that even want to. Well, that'll even take something like that. Well, that even know how to. That's a big one. I yeah. mean, like you are a, are a prime example. Um, being a newer tech, like half of these engines you've never even seen. I no. mean, like like you've never worked on an E Tech or no. a, or a Fict or no, a, no, no. I mean, you you might have worked on an, an OX sixty six. No, vaguely. No, I've never done anything. Um, I've never done anything engine wise to an OX sixty six. The only thing I've ever done to that is having to free up the swivel pin because mm. all the grease hardened up and got packed in there. Oh yeah. That's a, that's another thing that we didn't talk about. What? On some of those Yamahas, how they, the, where the engine turns on the bracket. Oh, that, that was a two. notorious thing for Yamaha. Yeah. That is a notorious thing for, for Johnson's and other engines too. Where like no one would grease it for so long right. that the grease that was in there would dry up and get stuck, and then now all of a sudden the engine won't turn, and you have to heat it up, drill holes in it, yep. like one at the top, one at the bottom, just to let all the grease out, and then you know you would thread it and put a grease cert fitting there. But um, yeah, that's that's a that I didn't I forgot about a, that. That's a scary job too, because I'm no. I'm no arsonist, man. I don't like fire. (laughs) You're giving me an acetylene torch or or an oxyacetylene torch, and I've got to, you know, sit there torching this engine for (laughs) God knows how long. I mean, I was there torching it for a minute before the stuff starts 
spewing out and then mm-hmm. you gotta like you know you gotta make sure you're not in the way oh yeah you're not in the blast zone because yep. that stuff will get so hot that it boils bubbles and boom just mm-hmm. shoots out of those holes and yep it's a, yeah and you definitely gotta be, have something there to catch it and stop it from getting you know but i only ever saw it be a problem on that that 10x66 i guess mm-hmm. i never i mean but you know you've got however many years experience how many but how many did you see how many did you quite have a few to take it quite a few to? Quite a few, but but again, that's not really. That's because of neglect. I mean, no yeah, one put any grease that's in there. Not, that's not that doesn't factor into reliability because I guess the the most important thing with reliability is will I make it back from my fishing trip? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And you'll make it back. It, yeah. it will in his particular case, especially he had twins. You know what I mean? So if you got a boat with twins, mm-hmm. and you can't turn the engines, not the end of the world. You no, know, just invert the. You, you've also got the aspect of, um, oh, shoot, now I forgot what I was going to say. But, um, oh, oh, um, a lot of the stuff that you talk about whenever it's not going to, like you're going to be stuck out there, mm-hmm. there's a lot of times where it's not even related to the engine. It's because you've got a problem with you got bad gas, your battery cables are messed up, like your batteries are dead, your chart, like... You've got an issue with the boat, yeah. That disallows the the engine from work. You got a leak in the boat. Your float switch doesn't work. The bilge pump's not coming on. Like you're mm-hmm. taking on water. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if you got a, a bad fuel tank, bad pickup, or a, a bad water separator or something like that, I mean, that's a boat issue. That's not even an engine issue, and that can happen to anybody. Yeah. I mean, everybody says, oh, if I've got, you know, two engines, three engines, four engines, I got eight engines back there, you know, I'm getting back on one. Well, if you got one fuel tank f- feeding those three engines, then bad gas is bad gas. Like, yep. you know. Don't matter. Don't matter. You, you, you ain't getting back. No. <laughs> How many times have you ever been uh, stranded out on a sea trial when you were working at the marina? Because I was fortunate enough to never get stuck out there i had one really close call and it was that xr it was that xr6 Mm -hmm. um and it was like my second sea trial on it (laughs) i took it over to your house because you Mm -hmm. lived right down the right down the canal yep and friggin that thing just it it started up and idled beautifully i got it fine-tuned ish at the dock i was like okay mm-hmm. let's see let's see you know if this thing will get on plane i made it to your house down the canal and boom shut right off like right in front of your house i'm like oh come on dude mm-hmm. i'm like really right now shuts off and then you're helping me get the thing started and you're like well listen this thing ain't gonna stay running there's something way jacked here yep. um so here's what you gotta do <laughs> <laughs> you were like rev it up or move the the throttle start it you know quickly put it in neutral and bang it back into forward and just take off yep and that's what i did i was on the phone with cj i'm like cj i'm coming in hot bro <laughs> i'm flying dude I can't, if i if i go any lower than 2000 rpm this thing's turning off catch me at the dock please <laughs> and that was a fun time but but other than that i've never been left stranded out there what's what's I'm trying to think because I can't remember ever getting stuck on a sea trial. Oh, because you're just that good a mechanic. You know, you've never. No, <laughs> no, There's no, never I, been nothing that you can't fix. Oh, getting stranded not, out there. I'm not saying happened. that at all. No. I'm not saying that at all. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of one because uh, I can't. Because the one that comes to mind is when I blew up that Johnson, but I had a kicker engine. I got that thing running and came back on that. Okay. Well, but look, not everybody just has the kicker engine. So no, that, it, that would count. You know what I mean? But I, I don't. You blew up the Johnson. How'd you do that? Was it the Johnson's fault or your fault? The, the guys, the guy brought the boat over and said, um, I got a problem with my engine. It's not run right. It's not, you know, it, it doesn't reach wide open throttle. It's not running right. Mm-hmm. Go down to the dock, start it, run it, sitting there idling fine. No problem. No nothing. Like this thing's running great. Just, just running. Like turn it, start it, rent it, ran it for like 10, 15 minutes at the dock. No problems. Checking some stuff over. No, nothing wrong. I'm like. I don't know. I mean, there's nothing wrong with this engine. Like, what do you want me to do? Like, so hop on it, go take it out, get up on plane, make it like, you know, heading down the beach, 
you know, it's like, you know, we go like maybe a mile, half mile down the beach and then, and then back made down to the end of the beach, heading back in. And it just goes, boom. And then, (laughs) and then, and then it just came off plane and stopped. And that was it. I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) I'm so mad. I've never heard an outboard blow up. I want to hear that so bad. I want to hear a pop. That's all it was. And, and so I'm like, what the heck was that? And so I, Turn the key, nothing doesn't, nothing happens at all. Oh. The minute it came up and then locked up, because um, the fly was locked up, and go back to take the cowling off, turn it, and the thing's locked up. But technically, that could also be a blown lower unit. What does a blown lower unit sound like? Do you know when it's like, when yeah. it's, you can, um, t- you can yeah. tell like from the, the way it sounded, like, okay, that's not a lower unit. Yeah, a lot of times you don't hear the lower units like you do the engine. Like when the engine blows, you usually hear it. Mm-hmm. When the lower unit blows, depending on how you're going, I mean, I blew up the lower unit on the Venture on that one of them 250s coming back from the lighthouse one time. We were out there diving, and um, we were coming back, and doing like 40 miles an hour just cruising and the port engine just lost power looking at the rpm and and it just lost a bunch of power engine was still running so or no no the engine shut off so then i'm like what the heck come off come off plane try and start it engine started up starts idling but now i'm hearing the gear kits just rattling around down there and and that was it so it's not it's not nearly as exciting as you might think like, you know, everybody's expecting to have like, you know, oh my gosh, a, a, a rod blows out the side of the block and out the cowling, like, oh, it's this big, you know, but most of the time it's just, your engine just stops running and then you notice it because you slow down right. and then either it won't restart or it's smoking real bad or like, you know, the gear case is rattling. Like mm-hmm. now if a gear case locks up, um, it can lock up and then, the engine will shut off because the drive shaft is in the crank and the crank can't turn no more. Right. So the engine will just shut off and then it won't restart because the starter doesn't have enough power to turn. Right. That's kind of what I was alluding to earlier, but, but I guess you just don't really hear a lower unit blowing up. It's not as exaggerated as you might think it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, I wonder what it sounded like when wasn't there, wasn't there an L6? I remember seeing an L6 powerhead that came off, I believe it was two conks, that had a rod out the side of it. Mm-hmm. That had a rod just hanging out the side. I, I want to know what that sounded like. Because there's no way you didn't hear that. I mean, a rod blowing through the side of an mm-hmm. engine. Big old hole in the block. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it was It was a probably loud boom and then probably some metal clinking around. <laughs> I mean, you know, like... That would be hilarious. <laughs> um... Those are, I mean, it's getting rare, honestly, to see, you know, that may, I don't think people blow powerheads like it used to be. No, definitely not like it used to be. Um, heck, the first V8 powerhead that I'd even heard of being mm-hmm. blown was Jack. And that was after 3,800, 4,000 hours or something mm-hmm. on that engine. And, um, yeah, like, you know. With the way they with the way they run those things, you know how often they're running them, how hard they're running them. Mm-hmm. Well, he puts two thousand hours a year exactly. on those engines. It's like it's so it's pretty impressive that yeah. That if something's gonna break, he's gonna be the one to break it. Mm-hmm. I mean, because the average person's not you're not putting two thousand hours on your engine a year. That's no. just no. some people don't put two thousand hours on it in ten years. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, I totally get. Um, you can't, I mean, you can bring up the, oh, well, you should have had it maintenanced more. And that's easy to say, but when you're really doing the math, you're putting 2,000 hours on in a year. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a lot of money to make, to, to keep up with every interval for service. Yeah, well, they do. I mean, but they're not main, like a lot of them, he, he has somebody that does that maintenance for him. Right. Like he has somebody that like they do. Change the oil, change the the gear lube, change the you know like like they just, it's not like the average person that, you know his, his might go, you know, he might change his gear lube at eighty hours. He might change it at one hundred and twenty hours. Like because mm-hmm. he's doing trips. You know, there's some days that it's ten hours a day. So yeah. 
he puts, you know, a hundred hours on it in just over a week. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, then that would just get ridiculous. I mean, it, it, well, it, it's hard to, you know, the boat's got to come out of the water. It's got to get down this, that, and the other. So it's, that's why he has someone that does all that. Mm -hmm. Um, like that's, that's his job is to service those engines and it's they put him in a rotation where you know he's also got over 20 boats now so it's like mm-hmm. got like 23 24 boats so in order for him to do that like you know he has he schedules all that out like you know he's got boats going down all the time just to get those oil changes in so it's a, that's a whole different other animal compared to you know that average person like you or I yeah no for sure All right, so what do you say we wrap this up, and uh, we'll see everybody next week? Yeah, yeah, we'll see everybody next week. We've been at this for a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if anybody wants us to cover a topic. Actually, we didn't even get to talk to anybody's comments today because this was all, this was actually someone's email wanting to talk about, you know, actually a few comments and an email about notoriously unreliable engines. But if you want us to have a discussion about your topic, then just comment below or Email us at askbab at bornagainboating.com.